Hello, and welcome to another edition of Slightly Problematic. So far, I've tried to problematize an uncritical approach to fieldwork and knowledge generation. This morning, I will attempt to explore the problematic process of directing social change. First, what is a theory of change? To answer that, let's explore why you are conducting research. Is it to add to the body of literature present within anthropology? Or are you hoping to be a catalyst for some type of positive change? One way which research can be applied to facilitating social change is through proving damage. This is generally referred to as damage-centered research. In this, a social scientist sets out to find a way to measure, in some manner, a harm which can be attributed to some cause. One classic example of this damage-centered research is Mammy and Kenneth Clark's doll test conducted in the 1940s. This test sought to prove that the systemic racism that young black children experienced could be measurably connected to internalized racism and black self-hatred. This research eventually was the basis for Thurgood Marshall's argument for desegregation of schools. The research was able to show injury of these young children and reasonably link it to the policies of segregation. Now, as Eve Tuck points out, this theory of change, testifying to damage so that persecutors will be forced to be held accountable, is extremely popular in social science research. So popular that it serves as a default theory of change, so ubiquitous that folks might think that it is entirely what social science is about. Now, there's little room to doubt that the extant structures of settler colonialism in the United States and the various forms of colonialism at play globally are clearly and measurably culpable for the consequences of systematized agendas of genocide, erasure, racism, and apartheid, which continue to be baked into the colonial social and political systems. But what's at stake when research is centered around litigational strategies? Now, the problem with damage-centered research, it's not surprising that the practice of placing expertise and authority in the hands of individuals who are more often than not white, male, and Western educated is quite palatable to the power structure. Damage-centered research fits well into colonial power structures because it mirrors the values and the structures of colonial society. Most prominently, the heteropatriarchy, which is normalized in the courtroom through the judge as the patriarch and the plaintiff or victim as the ward. And in this way, the courtroom reifies these roles. In litigation, damage is proven through testimony from the victim, argued and justified by experts, and judged dispassionately and objectively. However, there are several problems with this practice as it stands. First, words and narratives are powerful, and when you craft a persuasive story of a broken or damaged community or people, that narrative becomes part of how people inside and outside of the community might perceive the community and the people who live there. Two, it places the expertise and the authority as to what is wrong and what is needed to fix the problems within a community with the etic observer, that is, the outsider. Now linked to this, it runs the risk of becoming an intentional or unintentional agent of forced acculturation. For example, it was thought that the problem with black and indigenous societies was the weakness of their patriarchs. And so the natural solution was to enforce heteropaternalism and to displace the matriarchies which were generally present throughout North America and Africa. 
Ethnocentrism, as you can see, can be baked wickedly into the social ideas of what the ideal is or isn't. In Eve Tuck's Suspending Damage, A Letter to Communities, she introduces an alternative theory of change, that of desire-based research. Desire moves away from the reliance on an arbiter of harm and reparation, and rather than reifying paternalistic power dynamics, it is documenting not only the painful elements of social realities, but also the wisdom and hope present through survivance. Such an axiology is intent on depathologizing the experiences of dispossessed and disenfranchised communities so that people are seen as more than just broken and conquered. To put it into perspective, in this country, we have a deeply embedded construct of poverty as being pathological rather than situational. This is why money, housing, or food are not seen as solutions, but rather temporary fixes where the moral, intellectual, and cultural character of the individuals and communities is thought to be the actual problem. Desire is operationalized by Tuck through drawing upon discourse by two post-structuralists on the concept of desire. Desire as something which has been assembled, crafted over a lifetime through our experiences is the picking up of distinct bits and that, without losing their specificity, become integrated into a dynamic whole and is what accounts for the multiplicity, complexity, and contradiction of desire, how desire reaches for contrasting realities, even simultaneously. Now, the pushback against letting go of damage-based research. In my opinion, the main reason that damage-centered research is so hard to let go of is that in depicting certain groups as damaged or in need of protection, it aligns very well with the justifications for their disenfranchisement. Where would the Marshall Trilogy be without the concept of diminished sovereignty? The institution of African enslavement without attempting to frame the consequences or harm of middle passage, natal alienation, and the holocaust of enslavement as just cause for ongoing paternalism. The need to Americanize diasporic and immigrant communities to encourage them to let go of their backward ways and become truly American. Placing the desires of members of overstudied and disenfranchised communities as fundamentally valid and actionable information not only threatens the savior ideologies that cover the most pernicious of settler colonialism's agendas, but it also serves to deprivilege the monopoly on knowledge creation, which I touched on in my last video. But, you know, things change. And as Eve Tuck mentions, even Margaret Mead would not conduct research like Margaret Mead today. What I've tried to share in these last three videos is some of the, the best and most thought-provoking of what has been shared with me thus far, as to how to do better as anthropologists than has been done before. But hopefully, these things will be considered outdated and problematic in no time, because we will have continued to grow as a discipline and continue to refuse work that perpetuates harm to the communities that we work with and within. Thank you. And be sure to catch the remaining video in this season's lineup, as well as our summer lineup, as Slightly Problematic continues to co-create critiques and conversation. Cheers.